Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PC Magazine, and welcome to Fast Forward. I'm here at the new lab in Brooklyn at the Fast Forward event, which is curiously named, and I'm here with Naveen, Naveen Shinoy, the EVP and Intel's new general manager of the data center group, because he's got some big news today. You launched a new processor platform, uh, the Xeon Scalable Processor Platform. We're going to get into that. We're also going to talk about the future of the data center, how the data center enables 5G, autonomous driving, all these fascinating trends that we've covered on the show. Um, it's so great to have you here. Thanks so much for inviting me to this event. Thanks. It's great to be here. And congratulations on the name Fast Forward. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, the same name as this show. Um, so we're <laughs> completely thematically aligned. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about, uh, I want to talk about all of the impact of this new technology. But let's talk about the, the technology itself that you sure. launched today. Sure. Uh, the Xeon Scalable Processor Platform. W what makes this a scalable platform? Sure. Uh, you know, um, as we were thinking about this product, by the way, we've been working on this for five years, right? This is a, a long-term development product. Um, and we thought about the needs of the workloads in the data center as we look at things today. You talked about a few of them, autonomous driving. Um, it happens to be uh, prime day today. So the, 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 the workloads happening around us today, um, by definition, require scalability. Um, things that happened last year may happen order of magnitude faster this year, right? It's unpredictable. And uh, the data center infrastructure needs to be able to handle uh, that scalability. It needs to be able to scale up, it needs to be able to scale down, depending on what's happening with the workload. Uh, and so the dy dynamism, the dynamic nature of the way the technology world operates today, the way that workloads are developing, um, thought us to think about, okay, well, first of all, how do we design this thing for scalability? And then as we were thinking about naming it, we thought, why not just use that in the name and signify that there's something new here? Um, this product is, Xeon Scalable Processor is the uh, biggest advancement we've made in the data center in a decade. Uh, um, we don't take that lightly, right? A product like this comes along maybe once or twice in your career if you're lucky. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to and privileged enough to have been able to launch it today. So when you talk about making it scalable, it's really a, a system that's designed specifically for the data center. And you design them a little bit differently than you would a, a system that was going to go in a PC sure. or a workstation. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about what makes it, what's required for a data center specific processor? Sure. Um, uh, three things. First, we need to define it and design it for ultimate performance. I mean, orders of magnitude higher performance than you would have in a client device. Um, second, um, uh, security that's sort of built in for workloads that matter in the data center, encryption, uh, managing your data and securing your data at rest and flight. Um, and third, um, ensuring that you have agility and the ability to sort of move workloads from the private cloud to the public cloud, for example, right? All that stuff gets translated into the way you design the product. This is. Yeah, you brought show uh, and tell. You, this you is. Don't have show and tell on well, you know, I'm going to violate your rule, no, I guess. Uh, this is fast forward. This is what fast forward is all about, Absolutely. right here. This is a wafer of the new um, scalable Xeon processor. And um, it's amazing to me that somehow all this stuff works, right? There's billions of transistors on each of these products. Um, but this is done at a scale that you would never see in a, in, a, in a PC or in a laptop or in a, in a phone. 28 cores, 50% um, more PCIe and memory bandwidth, uh, um, a, a brand new mesh architecture that allows data to move seamlessly between all the cores. The mesh architecture, I'm going I'm to try and get the graphic that sure. illustrates the move from sure, the ring sure, architecture sure, to the sure, mesh architecture. Sure. It, it seems like very intuitive and like a brilliant way of, of, getting, of improving the chip. Yeah, it's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, depending on what your view of traffic in Manhattan is, the, mm -hmm. the grid system of traffic in Manhattan where you have things that are sort of north-south and east-west and you're able to sort of cut back and forth and go in any direction um, isn't really how processors was, were historically designed. If you had to move data from one processor in the lower left part of the die to the upper right part of the die, you had to go all the way around. Um, and go through a bunch of buffers and other things that would slow down the latency. Now you're able to sort of move data seamlessly from core to core uh, without having to go all the way around the ring. And that's really what the mesh was sort of designed for. Um, it's very unique. Uh, we think it's going to deliver, help us deliver the biggest gen-on-gen -gen performance improvement that we've, we've had in the last decade, right? Uh, we anticipate about a 65% improvement uh, generation to generation uh, on a broad range of workloads. Uh, on artificial intelligence workloads, up to 2x improvement um, uh, based on the hardware, and up to 100x improvement when you add software, uh, software optimization on top of that hardware. So, super excited about the product, and uh, 
um, and we'll see what happens from here. And you already have units in the field, like you're launching today, yeah. but you have a number of partners that have been using this this uh, system for months now. Yeah, you picked up on that, that's, that's great. Um, this is the general availability launch, but we did something different this time. We did an early ship program starting in November of last year uh, to get this product into the hands of our most demanding customers. About 30 customers have their hands on the product, about 500,000 units we've already shipped. And you heard a number of those customers come on stage today and talk about the benefits they're seeing from the performance, the security, the agility that we're delivering. Companies like AT&T, companies like Google, company like, companies like Amazon Web Services, healthcare companies like Monte, Monte Fiori. Yeah, their examples uh, are fascinating. Yeah, I mean, like a totally ability, different approach to healthcare. Yeah, the ability to sort of predict what's going to happen um, to somebody through looking at their genomic data, looking at their pattern of health, uh, looking at their pattern of uh, uh, doctor visits, um, looking at their uh, health history looking at their, um, uh, their family's history, right? Combining all that stuff, using data analytics to sort of say, hey, listen, five years from now, your probability of getting such and such is X, and therefore you might want to consider the following lifestyle changes. That's really the future of healthcare. And, and so, anyway, it's great to have those enterprise companies using this technology. I got to tell you, there's an insatiable appetite to get these products into the hands of customers earlier and earlier. And that, that requires a new way of thinking in terms of the way we develop and launch uh, uh, products. Yeah, it seems like, and I, I keep hearing this described as there's an infinite desire for compute. Like there's just no maximum, there's no cap, we just need more. And we need more for these cutting edge applications. And it's across multiple industries. You know, one of the things I talked about today is a lot of, a lot of pundits in the industry talk about the, the flood of data that we're seeing generated by all the sensors out there and the move to video and higher definition video and and virtual reality, and augment, all that stuff is generating lots of data, right? Uh, but I think what's more interesting is that we're literally nowhere in terms of actually doing something with all that data, processing it, analyzing it. Um, probably, let, our estimate is that less than 1% of the data generated on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis is actually being used. And so, um, as that data becomes to be analyzed and used, that's just going to drive the demand for more processing capability. And, and that's why we have such an insatiable appetite, because we're, we're, we're really doing, we're just scratching the surface of what we could do with all that data. It seems like that's the next big challenge, is that we can, we can capture the data, we can store the data, and we're just now starting to be able to make sense of that data. That's right. But that's where we need this infinite compute stack. That's right, so it's, good, it's good for us, it's good for our customers, it's good for many others in the industry. And, so we're excited about you know, what the future holds. Very cool. I've got some standard questions I ask all of our guests. I know you're pressed for time. Um, what technology, concern, technology trend concerns you the most going forward? Is there anything well, that keeps you up at night that I, you worry I think, about? I think there, are, um, there is a need to think about the societal impact of artificial intelligence, um, to think about what does it mean for jobs, what does it mean for um, retrainment, uh, uh, retraining, uh, so that people have the skills, so that uh, they can continue to be employed. I, I, while I worry about that, I'm also optimistic that we as a society will figure those things out, just like we have in previous technology deflections. Um, I'm also optimistic about artificial intelligence. Uh, we talked about the healthcare uh, uh, one. Um, I mean, I, I talked about farming and how, you know, to feed the, the, the population on Earth farmers need to find another 50% increase in production of food. There's no more farmland. In fact, there's probably less farmland yeah. over time. So how do we increase farm production by 50% with less farmland? Those problems are only going to be solved but through the application of technology. Yeah, it seems like there, there are a number of problems that we have to deal with today. We've always been able to innovate our way out or around those problems, and AI seems like a fundamental technology to help us do that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the optimism, you've, you mentioned you're optimistic about AI. Is there, is, that the, is there anything that you are more optimistic about that gives you more hope in the technology sector? Um, I think we are at the verge of solving some of the greatest problems in human history. And all of that will be solved through some application of technology, um, whether that be the healthcare related issues, finding a cure to cancer. I mean, we will, we, that will happen, hopefully in our lifetime. And um, that will happen through the application of technology. Um, autonomous driving, I mean, it's amazing to me how much car infrastructure is deployed and how little it's utilized, right? 4% of cars in the world are actually utilized. 
Um, and if you look at the trillions of dollars of capital that are deployed in terms of automobiles and the utilization rate of that, you go, well, this is insane. You would never do that in a, in a traditional factory, for example, right? So our ability to sort of increase the utilization of that technology and improve safety, dramatically improve safety, um, uh, I think uh, is something I'm optimistic about. So I, I tend to be, I lean on the side of optimism. I believe that technology flows like a river. It's never going to stop. Um, and it's up to us in the industry to go figure out how to take advantage of it. Is there a single device that you wear, that you carry, that you use every day, or an app that's really uh, transformed your life? Yeah, I'm not going to say the phone because you don't, told me not to. Everyone else says that, right? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, I, just, I just had 30 people from my family at my house all um, uh, staying in different rooms. And the one thing that was a saving grace for us was the Sonos system I have in the house because mm -hmm. everyone wanted to hear something different. And, I got tired of hearing Hamilton play over and over and over again, so I was able to play different music in my room, and my family was able to play other things in other, in other rooms. So, so Sonos, uh, Sonos, Sonos saved me, <laughs> I would say. So that's one that comes to mind. Yeah, it's great. And, and you've got access to your entire library. And just you know, in my lifetime, we've gone from scarcity in music to being able to listen to any song ever recorded with a, you know, just by asking for it. My niece wanted to hear Fireball over and over and over again, and I refused to buy it, but we could find it online for free, so it was great. It's pretty great. <laughs> Good to meet you. I know you don't have too much time. I wanna thank you so much for joining us on Fast Forward today. That is our show for today. It's a quick one, but we'll be back next week with a brand new show. Remember, you can get this show on Apple Podcasts. You can get it on Google Play. You can get it anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks for joining us, and thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Take care. See you.